Now I mow my bit of grass and make a little rick. And in the summer, while you grow, my cow do run on in common for to pick a blade or two of grass, if she can find them. But t'other cattle don't leave much behind them. And then, besides our cow, why we'd let our geese run out among the Emmet Hills. And in the winter, we do fat them well, and car them to the market for to sell to gentlefolks. And then, when I had nothing else to do, why I can take my hook and gloves and go and cut a lot of buzz and briars for hating ovens or for lighting fires. This is farming today. Changed beyond the wildest dreams of the country people who less than a hundred years ago lived off their land kept their cow and fatted their geese to sell to gentlefolk. Whether we like it or whether we don't, those days are gone for good. And farming nowadays is a business, and a highly skilled, highly competitive business at that. It was a bit over 200 years ago that farming started changing, growing up into a business. As the Industrial Revolution drew people from the land into cities and the great commercial centers, so these rapidly growing populations made the first demands on the farming community for greater efficiency and higher production. Phrases we're still very familiar with today. And year by year, as the cities grew, the agricultural output grew with them. But it seems that every step forward we take in modern life brings not only new advantages, but new problems. And so it has always been. With the development of modern methods of transport came competition for the farmer in his growing market in the form of cheap imported produce from abroad. And to the first of his basic problems, that of keeping production levels high enough to satisfy the needs of the country's larder, was added a second. How to do this at a cost low enough to meet competition and still show a reasonable return for the long hours and hard work of his seven-day-a-week job. Production up, costs down, is a problem as old as commercial farming itself. And it is with us now as much as ever. But today, we've got science on our side. And with its help, we've gone a long way on the road to finding an answer. The bit of grass we mow, nowadays, has behind it years of research into soil properties and plant nutrition and seed fertility, as we cut not only bigger, but better quality crops to every acre. And this is true of every aspect of arable farming. And far from Picking a blade of grass on the common, our scientifically bred herds are fed a balanced scale of nutrition, without which their high gallonage yields just wouldn't be possible. Yes, even the most conservative farmer today would agree that farming is scientific. And why shouldn't it be? As far as we're concerned, scientific means efficient. And wherever you look in farming, you can see evidence of scientific research and the readiness with which the successful farmer has put the scientist's discoveries to work within his own pattern of management. Like farming itself, research goes on day in and day out all over the world, continually discovering new or improved ways of producing more quickly, more cheaply, in fact more efficiently. And I think it's true to say that nowhere are these advantages to be seen more clearly than in the field of animal feeding. 
young people starting in on livestock farming nowadays must understand nutrition. Not just the oil, fiber, and protein analysis, but the whole range of an animal or a bird's nutritional needs and the ways we have of satisfying them. As we progress through breeding development further and further away from purely natural livestock, with birds capable of laying 230 to 240 eggs a year, or the cows producing more than a thousand gallons of milk in a single lactation, or the pig achieving specialized body conformation and wait for bacon in under six months. So the specialized feeding of these animals to make the greatest use of their inbred capacity for growth becomes something the farmer must really understand. We must make sure first that the feeds we give to our stock do satisfy all their nutritional needs. And second, that our poultry and our pigs and our cattle are able to make the fullest use of these feeds. Nutritional research and the improved production facilities of the great feed compounding industry are making it more and more easy to feed a completely balanced ration. But how to make sure that these feeds are not wasted has for many years been a more difficult problem. There is probably no such thing as a completely healthy animal now that may sound a bit far-fetched, but looking back, we can all remember the birds which didn't lay up to expectation, or the batch of pigs that took longer to get to market than we'd reckoned on. There didn't seem to be anything wrong with the look of them, but they just didn't do so well. Well, livestock like this are nearly always suffering from what is called subclinical disease. Now this is quite simply the result of a build-up of harmful bacteria inside the bird or animal which have the effect of upsetting the smooth working of its body to the extent that both its physical development and its production capacity are reduced. Now this is a very real condition which has prevented farmers for many years from getting the full margin of profit from their investment in stock and feeding stuff. And then along came the scientists with an answer in the form of a new antibiotics discovery. For in 1949, at the cyanamid laboratories at Pearl River in America, scientists came upon an absolutely new growth factor in animals. The year previous, vitamin B12 had been discovered, and the cyanamid workers were trying to find out how much of this new vitamin was present in certain fermentation residues. Tests showed, however, that when these residues were added to the feed of young chicks, they grew faster and looked better than when vitamin B12 alone was added. This remarkable difference over a long series of tests proved to be due to a substance called oreomycin chlortetracycline, which was a broad-spectrum antibiotic, which is a lot simpler than it sounds. Let me explain. The bacteria which build up under normal farm conditions, retarding growth and development, aren't all the same kind. There are many different species, and of the many antibiotics that have been discovered, some have an effect on a few kinds of bacteria, while others affect many kinds. It isn't very difficult, therefore, to understand why those which act on a limited range are called narrow-spectrum antibiotics, and those that are effective over a wide range are called broad-spectrum antibiotics. In the cyanamid laboratories, Long and careful experiments with the new broad-spectrum antibiotic oreomycin proved that when minute quantities were added to an already balanced feed, the growth response was far and away above that from the same feed without the new antibiotic. Comparisons of weight and development told really remarkable stories. The birds that had been fed with oreomycin were heavier, feathering was more complete, and mortality was cut right down. Pigs grew faster, with sounder carcass formation, they suffered less from costly and wasteful diseases. And they made better and therefore cheaper use of their feed. And this general picture didn't apply just to farm animals. Dogs were healthier and more vigorous. Rabbits put on flesh better and faster, 
and mink grew better with finer, thicker coats, proving the general benefit to be gained by all animals. But of course, the real value of this discovery was with farm animals, and the problem facing the scientists was that of turning a laboratory discovery into a practical farming fact. The whole cyanamid research team, with its enormous resources of knowledge and machinery, concentrated on the problem of producing the most effective feed supplement. And they needed all their resources, for they were dealing with a very potent material which needed only to be used in minute quantities per tonne of feed, despite its far-reaching effects. With laboratory tests satisfactorily finished, Cyanamid then carried out a series of field trials, first on their own experimental farms, and then under practical conditions on farms all over the country. Well, I've no doubt that, like me, a lot of you read about this work in the farming press. As I've said, you've got to keep abreast of what's new these days. And I expect, like me, you read of the results that farmers in America were getting and wondered, perhaps with some mental reservation, just how this new development in feeding would affect our own livestock on British farms under our own conditions of management. And we farmers weren't the only ones thinking this way. The British firms and institutions carried out many exhaustive field trials until in 1953, official blessing was given for the use of oreomycin in commercial feed. Either mixed in by the compounder, or available to the farmer as Orofac 2A. Now I'd better explain that I'm running intensive pigs and poultry, and for the last few years I've run about 30 breeding sows, taking most of the pigs through to bacon, and about 1,500 layers on deep litter with about 2,000 growers to follow on. Obviously, if oreomycin was as effective as it was supposed to be, it could save me a lot of money. And I'm not one of the people who think they've got enough of that. So after a while, I decided to go round and ask other farmers, who had been a bit quicker off the mark than me, about the results they were getting. My first worry was cost. I was using a good compounded feed, and I couldn't see how it would pay me to lay out another 10 shillings a ton for fattener, or as much as a bob a hundredweight for the rearing meal. Well, among others, Mr. E. W. Pepper of Steeple Morden in Hertfordshire gave me the answer. He was one of the very first Orofac users in this country, and the generally improved health of his whole herd has meant as far as he's concerned that for every four and threepence a pig he spends on oreomycin, he gets at least an extra pound a pig profit. Of course, I found the profit figures varied from farm to farm, but were always quite convincing, and the tests carried out at the Agricultural Research Council's field station at Compton showed an extra profit of 29 shillings a pig. Down at Lower Gurnock's farm at Broad Wasp, in Worcestershire, Mr. Tyerman was much more concerned with that old bugbear scouring. His piglets hadn't been eating, and as a result, they were doing very poorly. After arranging to have oreomycin included in his creep feed, the trouble cleared up, and on his farm, he's continued to feed it regularly to his young pigs with no more trouble and weaning weights higher than he's had before. In Worcestershire, Mr. T. Jackson of Acton Farm near Starport with over 5,000 birds kept both on deep litter and in batteries, was naturally enough a great believer in bringing all his birds into lay at the same time. We've all known the nuisance and cost of having late starters in any system, and he'd found that oreomycin in the feed for around five or six weeks before moving the birds off range and into their laying quarters had got all his birds off to a really good start at the same time. And he said they laid better too. So did Mr. K. Beard of Lee Sinton in Worcestershire, when I saw him later in the year. His birds were averaging 85%, and he told me that he personally reckoned it was a good thing to feed in oreomycin about 36 grams to the ton about midway through the season, to ease them over the strain of this regular high production. He didn't get so many birds breaking down, he said, and the cost was more than covered by the extra eggs he got from all the birds.
pigs again when I called at Nether Street Farm at Bromham in Wiltshire and met Mr. David Leonard. Breeding troubles a couple of years ago had started him using it. He was getting more than his share of runts. And I don't suppose there are many of us who haven't been sorry to do away with young pigs as not worth keeping. But Mr. Leonard added three quarters of a pound of Aurifact 2A to each hundredweight of his creep feed and actually got his runt pigs through to bacon at the same time as those on normal rations. And from a profit point of view, it paid off very well. Another laying bird situation I ran into on my travels was on Mr. R. Pauling's farm at Ticehurst in Sussex. He normally kept around 3,000 laying birds, and he was very sure of the advantages he was getting. You see, he said, I'm working on the whole on fairly tight margins, and any sudden drop in egg production affects me a lot. You never know quite when that'll happen, but when it does, I've got to get onto it quickly. I always keep a supply of Aurifac ready to mix in with the mash as a sort of emergency measure till I can get in a stock of feed with it in, and it really does get them going again. Another thing he told me was that like many smaller farmers, he always ran a few birds on for the second year, and by including oreomycin in the ration towards the end of that time, he could extend the laying period by as much as six to seven weeks. What's more, their body weight kept up right to the end, and he got a much better price when he eventually cleared them out. I suppose among the smaller pigmen, buying in wieners from a number of other farms, the greatest enemy is virus pneumonia. Mr. W. Stevens of Embra in Worcestershire told me that whenever he heard that dry cough in his houses, he used, in his mind, to add another three weeks to his feeding bill, if he was lucky. Because the real danger is that while virus pneumonia in itself doesn't do much harm, it pulls the pigs down and lays them open to secondary infections which really do cause damage. For him, oreomycin had seemed to build up the growing pig's resistance to these secondary infections and had cut out that coughing that none of us likes to hear from our pigs. One of my biggest objections was overcome, not by a farmer interested like myself in pigs and laying birds, but by Lieutenant Colonel Corbett of Oxhouse Shobden in Herefordshire, who takes around 20,000 turkeys through his farm every year. I'd always felt that if your management were really good, antibiotics wouldn't make much difference. There wasn't much doubt about the standard of management on Colonel Corbett's farm. And when I told Mr. Percy Bailey, the turkey manager, what was in my mind, he laughed. Yes, he said he'd had just that thought himself. What's more, when he'd started on Orofac, he'd been unable to see any difference in his birds, and he'd said so to his traveller who came along to see him. But he was told that unless he was using it at the correct level, he might as well drop his money down a drain. Better still keep it and not use antibiotics at all. He had been using 5 grams to the ton, but when he switched to the proper level of 18 grams, he could see the difference. The bolts feathered better, got away quicker, and he had far fewer casualties. They ate better, and while feed conversion improved slightly, he raised his average weight per bird to market by more than two and a quarter pounds in the same time. And as far as he was concerned, he found it paid to feed all the way through from hatching to slaughter. Just like my broiler contact down in Sussex, Mr. M.B. Mills, manager of Fisher Farms Limited. There's really no other answer for broilers, he said. Just look at the birds you've got on these floors here. If you think you're working to tight margins in other branches of farming, you want to try this business. Well over a quarter of a million birds have got to leave our farms about every ten weeks weighing an average three and three quarter pounds. What's more, we don't make a living unless our feed conversion is better than three to one. We can't afford to lose birds, and we're only getting a three percent mortality here now. As far as I'm concerned, preventative level oreomycin in the feed isn't a matter of choice, it's an absolute necessity. All these men and others I met and talked to were practical farmers who were just saying what they had proved for themselves. Maybe some of you have seen some familiar faces, people you yourselves know. And what these men thought convinced me too. I think I knew then that mine had been a profitable journey, and that's what it's turned out to be.
On my farm today, the use of antibiotics is an integral part of my management program. It's giving me a greater overall margin of profit than I had before, at little additional cost or trouble. My birds are laying better, both in numbers and size of eggs, and they're doing it on less feed. I often wonder how many of us realize the amount of food material we waste by its passing unchanged through the body of an animal or bird not healthy enough to make use of it. When your birds are using all their feed to the full, then your profits aren't going into the droppings pit. And it's no trouble because I'm using a proprietary feed fortified with the correct level of oreomycin by the compounder, both in the laying houses and in the starter ration for the baby chicks. My pigs, of course, are a different matter, but they're really no more trouble to feed. For my young litters, I'm using a proprietary creep feed, which has built into it the manufacturer's recommended level of 36 grams of oreomycin per tonne. Young pigs need a good creep feed to carry them over the fall-away period of the sow's lactation, and personally, I carry it on for a couple of weeks after I move the sow away from them, so that they don't get the upset of separation and of a feed change at once. After that, I change them gradually over to my compounder's wiener ration, with oreomycin at the rate of 18 grams per ton. You'll notice how even the litters are. And while I'm weaning out at around the 43 pound average, it's that evenness which I think is really important. I don't get valuable fattening house accommodation occupied by one or two slower pigs, and bullying and fighting isn't any sort of a problem. When they get to around the 120 pound mark, I use a pig finishing ration, which I make up myself. I grow a lot of my own grain, which I mix with a balancer meal. And I'm able to reduce the amount of oral fat that I add to this feed to only 10 grams a ton. And believe me, it pays. Isn't that a lot of trouble, people ask me? Well, judge for yourself. I mix up a couple of tons of feed at a time, and I weigh out my six pounds of aura pack, which is sufficient for two tons of feed at the 10 gram level. How do I know? Well, there's a simple little table on the back of the bag, which gives all the information you want. So many grams per ton, so many pounds per ton. And in practice, I find it works out at about six handfuls for six pounds. I put about half a ton of my meal into the mixer. And add the balancer. I leave it to turn over in the machine while I mix up a bit of my barley meal with the aura effect by hand, as thoroughly as I can. Then I feed this into the mixer by the scoopful and then let in the rest of the cereal and let it turn over for about half an hour. Doing it like this, I make sure I get a thorough mix and that's all there is to it. Well, that's oreomycin on my farm. When I add it to my own feed, I use Orifac 2A, which is this. But as I've told you, I also have oreomycin already mixed into my compounded feeds. I suppose that if you'd walked around my farm four years ago, you would say you couldn't see much difference today. But how can you see two weeks less feeding for every pig on the place? Just how different does a bird that is laying 17 dozen eggs a year really look from one that is laying 20 dozen? How can you see unseen disease, subclinical disease, or walking round a farm see lower mortality, or all the other benefits that oreomycin can bring? You can see them only as I did, in the results that others, and finally you yourself, can achieve by its use. And so we come full circle. For today, efficient farming, we said, is scientific farming, 
And here, surely, is a contribution by science that we who farm can take and use with confidence and meet the challenge of today with the methods of tomorrow.